There is very little litigation in the United States over age discrimination today. And how do we know that? Well, no university, no business wants, in effect, to get itself into a position where it has to defend its traditional employment policies, which says retire at 65. Unless there's a statutory exemption, which there is for senior officials, but nobody else, you know that a policy which essentially takes a universal practice of asking people to leave firms at age 65, for example, is now flatly illegal. What's the effect that this has on the population at large? Well, it is a huge wealth transfer to folks in my generation, or at least those who are a little bit older than me. No question about it. When I leave the University of Chicago, they're going to have to buy me out. So not only do they give me a pension over 40 years, they have to give side payments afterwards. Senior people love it. This is great. Can't imagine a better situation. On the other hand, while I sit in a gold-plated chair, all the young people who want to come up, many of whom are women, many of whom are minority members, they sit on what we call affectionately in universities on folding chairs. Now, why is it that their chairs fold up underneath them? It's because the universities that have to pay lavish pensions to senior faculty members are that much more strapped when it comes to hiring junior members. And not only that, they see the writing on the wall so that one direct consequence of basically converting tenure to 65 into a lifetime contract is that universities are now very reluctant to give tenure to as many faculty members that they used to do. So we have squads of two-year professors, five-year professors, rotating professors of one kind or another, all of whom are on term contracts just to avoid that eventuality. What does this do? It really hurts the prospects of the young. How much? Well, we know the numbers. And basically, if you want to sum them up, this is what they say. They say that for every person you want to keep at age 60 for another year, there are two people you can't hire at age 35. So that what happens is you systematically narrow the set of opportunities by interfering with the normal system of life cycle employment, which was perfectly rational in the pre age discrimination age. Now let's just put the rubber to the road and ask the following very simple question. Suppose you're a young black person who wants to go into a business like mine, academics. Which is going to be more important to you? The age discrimination laws that don't apply to you by name or the race discrimination laws that protect you against discrimination by a university that's only too eager to hire you? Well, frankly, my dear, the race discrimination laws don't matter very much in the kind of a hothouse environment that I'm in. Anybody who wants to discriminate overtly on the grounds of race inside a university or in most large business corporations, just mass will close up and go. You don't have to worry about the government. The employer is going to take care of it because they can't stand the poison that it creates in the atmosphere. These laws give them very little protection. Well, what about affirmative action? Well, you don't need the government to allow that. It can be done voluntarily. The real culprit is now the age statute. And there is no doubt, if you want to talk about the full impact of the entire set of anti-discrimination laws in employment on people of color and women, it has been negative. And it has been negative because you have to consider them all as a series, rather than just simply looking at them one at a time. So for all you young folks out there, it's the system that matters, not the individual case. And if you get the right system, the cases will take care of themselves. If you get the wrong system, the individual cases tell you nothing. Now that's part of it. What's another part of it? Well, once you introduce an employment discrimination law, what happens is, I'm going to talk for about another 10 minutes, is that about right? Just go on, he says. <laughs> it's no longer an easy world to work in. To give you a famous legal doctrine, before you introduce anti-discrimination laws, the old rule which was created by the judges, and rules created by judges are called common law rules, the rules that are common law to all the people in the realm, was called a contract at will. And what that meant is that you could take a job and not take a job for good reason, for bad reason, or for no reason at all. And an employer could hire you for good reason or bad reason, or no reason at all. So in effect, everybody can act like the queen of spades if they want to. Off with your head, out you go. Arbitrary dismissals are perfectly okay. 
That never happened that way. Because it turns out when you start firing people arbitrarily, they'll quit with a vengeance and your whole, whole workforce will go to pieces. So that this system actually imposed a lot of discipline on employers because they knew the threat to quit by other workers when they treated one badly was devastating. And anyone who's ever been in a management position knows. You mess up with one good employee, ten other good employees will leave before you can do anything. So you've just got to play this thing right. Now what happens when you introduce an anti-discrimination law? Well, it's no longer this cheap system that whatever you do, the legal system is going to respect. Now you have to prove that the person you fired was for reasons going to merit and was not for cause and was not rather for some illegal motive. This turns out to be extremely difficult to do. It's just very hard. So what happens? Well, the first happen thing that happens is you look at some cases from 1966. There are a lot of employers who don't know the new drill, and you do find some of them who make sort of ugly racist remarks as they fire workers. By 1970 or 75, those cases are gone. Now they're all complicated cases in which the employer is going to start to say, hey, I'm firing this guy because he came late to work. And the employer says, well, he let the white guy stay on when he came late to work. Why are you firing me? And then they say, well, you know, you would miss seven days of work and he only missed three. And then he comes back and says, but he was out for a longer period of time on the days he missed than I was. And by the time you're done, trying to figure out whom you can fire and whom you could not creates this huge paper record this huge testimonial aggregation. And for what? Nothing, as far as I can see. It's great work for us lawyer types. But in the end, if you know it's hard to fire people because of proving cause, you're not going to hire people whom you think may be risky. Whom does this hurt? It hurts workers without track records. Who are those? Usually people with weaker educations, often from poorer families, often members of minority groups. So the protection you get at dismissal has as a very bad indirect effect an unwillingness to hire people in the first place. Again, it's the system that matters. You just can't look at the individual incident in isolation. Now, it gets even worse than that in my judgment. Because what happens is the plaintiff's lawyer come up and they say to the judges, this stuff of proving individual cause is just for the birds you're on. They're a little more technical than that. We can't prove it. And by the way, everybody knows that since all these employers are bigots, which is no longer even remotely true, what they do is they just learn how to cover their tracks. They engage in silent, secret, hidden, subterranean, or even unconscious discrimination. you got to get at them. And we can't prove it. So you've got to give us some other help. And sure enough, they did. What they did is they said, look, what we have to do is, in effect, to make sure that certain kinds of practices, which when carried out lots of times, don't result in what they call disparate impact, having an unintended effect to hurt minority members more than anybody else. Well, what kind of practices can do that, you would ask? You name it, it can do it, is the appropriate answer. So that the first of these cases ask the question of whether or not if you wanted for some kind of planned job to require workers to have a high school diploma or its equivalent, what you discovered, at least in North Carolina, or at least in 1970, is that more black workers were hurt by that requirement than white workers. And so the Supreme Court said this thing has got a disparate impact. It's presumptively illegal, in which you could, unless you could show, technically speaking, absolutely positively you had to have it i.e. some kind of business necessity, which is almost impossible to do, because there's always some other thing that you can use. And if you don't like diplomas, what about tests? Well, now you can't use aptitude tests, an employment preference test, psychological tests, intelligence tests, no tests, if they have any disparate impact. Which tests have a disparate impact? Just about every one, as it turns out. Now what happens is this. You're going to stop a little bit of discrimination, maybe, but not very much. What you're really going to do is make it harder for people to figure out whom to hire and whom to train and whom to promote. Because all the tests that you have to give must be so job specific and so narrow that they don't give you any ideas to whether or not a work is going to be good over a 10 year period. 
they only tell you whether or not he could do the task for the immediate job. No sane personnel officer wants to hire a person because he can do this task in the next two weeks or the next year. Any serious personnel officer wants to figure out whether or not this is a person we ought to invest in by training for promotion, for advancement, so that maybe 10 years down the road he or she could be a division manager and perhaps a president. Can't do that anymore. So what does it mean? It means that the use of the anti-discrimination laws really mess up the entire employment processes in the way in which they would operate. So what's the lesson? And I think I kind of could close on this. It's that there's no doubt when historically we looked at these things, there was so much government coercion that surrounded labor relations. It was sensible as a transitional matter to try to figure out how it is that you could stop discrimination because we knew why it took place. But the background conditions have changed. Americans may not like to admit it, but sometimes they do things more right than wrong. And getting rid of the overwhelming sense of racial hatred and bias in this country over the last 70 or 80 years has been a signal national accomplishment. If one starts to look at the kinds of things that routinely happen, from lynchings to white primaries, to segregated schools in the 1930s, and then look at the world today, you can't just say nothing has changed, it's just all gone underground. There's been an enormous change. Well, the Civil Rights Acts, like all statutes, become rigid. They don't change with it. So a statute which may have made some sense on a transitional basis now sits there on the books. We can't live with that statute. We already know that. We've repealed half of it because we allow affirmative action. That's a return to voluntary markets. It seems to work. The real question is, why not go the whole way and get rid of the rest of it? Well, there may be some people who will start to discriminate, but this is what's going to happen. They will form the white bigot firm, and all 20 hotheads will go join them. That makes every other business easier to run, because these guys aren't around to mess you up anymore. So always look for voluntary sorting as a way to solve your problem. So there is, I think, a real lesson here, which is not that we're in favor of anarchy, not that we're in favor of rebellion, not that we believe in zero taxes, not that we think that discrimination can't happen when certain industries have monopoly power, because it can, but that if you keep labor markets competitive, if you spend your time trying to reduce barriers to entry so that it's easy for firms to come in and easy for firms to leave, you will do much better than if you constantly try and regulate the way in which everybody in a market behaves. So this is the central position of classical liberalism. It doesn't only apply to labor law. It applies to all sorts of things having to do with production and industry. And it's this proposition. And if I could leave the young ones here with only one thought, this is what I'd like you to remember. In a system where you're trying to organize a just social order, free entry beats government regulation every time. Thank you.